necessary in our lives. And I think, um, you know, everywhere uh, people have been, you know, uh, you know, actively, obviously looking to connect to uh, greater public space, open space, green space, park space, uh, whether in there in small communities or big cities. Um, and I think we all have realized if, if we've been out, uh, if we were out outside in the parks or the trails or along the Erie Canal, uh, which I was a lot biking uh, during during lockdown, um, you know, I think we saw just the number of people that needed to get out and needed to explore, um, needed, you know, uh, a space to, uh, to, to be, to, to feel comfortable, to feel a sense of sanity in this, in this uh, uh, unsettling time. Um, I think the idea of public space being essential uh, became really, you know, came to the forefront in, in so much of Amer the American mind. Um, and across the world, of course, too. Um, so I love that statement. I think that was, you know, tremendous. And also not just how we connect with parks, but also the fact that parks um, can bring people together. That's essential in our lives, right? We need that. Uh, you know, uh, public spaces can uh, be tremendous engines for economic uh, growth and activity. We need that in our, in our communities uh, more than ever as well. So uh, lots of different ways, I think, that public space is essential. And I love uh, the way uh, Commissioner Silver put that. I think, that, that, I think that was wonderful. Great, thank you. Molly? Sure, um, you know, I, I think I took a little bit of a, a different um, perspective away from it. You know, working in uh, planning consulting field and working a lot with landscape architects as well um, at, with the projects we do, I was really intrigued with how much of what he said resonated and could be applied to across communities of all sizes, um, particularly when he talked about inventorying. And he mentioned inventorying in two capacities. Um, so there was one, your more traditional concept of, you know, where are your parks? When was the last time you put money into parks? You know, which ones are getting the love, which ones aren't? Um, and, you know, are they up to snuff, so to speak. But then the second piece that he talked about was inventorying your experiences and the idea of looking at, so, you know, do you have four great, super passive recreational parks, but nowhere for skateboarders, nowhere for, you know, other types of recreational activities um, and that are providing different opportunities. Um, you know, wherever they're located, big park, small park, etc. So those were kinds of the two things that I, you know, I mean, there was a ton <laughs> to clean off of what he said, but the two big things is one looking at like the functionality of the park, um, its experience, and the other concept of how you support them and your plan for supporting them and growing them over time. Thank you, Molly. That's a great point. Andre? Yeah, I'm, one of the points that, uh, really resonated with me was uh, similar to what Molly said, the, the sort of diligence of the inventory and sort of the, you know, I've heard so many complex uh, discussions about what equity means. And I love that he came up with his definition of equity and just said fairness, you know, just <laughs> make it simple. And, um, you know, I think that, uh, I mean, I remember a long, long time ago when I was in college, uh, I took a, a personal finance class and basically the main thing that I learned in that class was don't put all your money in one place. Uh, instead, do something like a mutual fund where you can have your money in lots of different places and all those investments average out and they go like that. But somehow I feel like as a city, uh, Rochester has this tendency to say, well, let's put all our eggs in one basket. <laughs> this is the project that's going to fix everything. This is the thing. Um, and just the diligence of saying, well, let's just go up the list of every little park that hasn't had an update recently and let's update it, you know? Um, uh, I think is really just a good uh, prudent way to invest in a community. Uh, and, and that's the main thing that I took away. I think the other thing that I took away was just um, the, the, the discussion he had about um, permeability and the parks without borders uh, idea. And, um, you know, we don't have that same sort of thing in, in Rochester where we're always putting uh, fences around parks like they do in, in New York City. Um, but we have other sorts of borders, I think, in some of, the, some of our, our parks, um, whether they be kind of psychological border, borders or just like um, the way that uh, they're designed 
they just stop so abruptly and they don't reach out to the rest of the community. Uh, and I think that um, we really have something to learn from uh, the way that he was thinking about entrances, exits, uh, and, and ways that those borders uh, address the community around them. Thank, thank you, Andre. I know, I, I think that point, um, the, your last point couldn't be illustrated better than when he showed those um, slides about the edges and when he talked about the sidewalk becoming the main walk and the incredible benefit there was to removing that, that barrier to the, to the actual public space and expanding that permeability, as, as he said, uh, where they put benches under the trees that were part of that other public space, but weren't necessarily designated to the park. And, and that opened up uh, access and it opened up sight lines and it just made the space more functional, but also just more welcoming. Any of, any of you in the audience wanna share a takeaway? Um, I can only see people if they put their hands up or, just jump, jump on in. It's a small enough group. I think we can, we can manage. Hey, this is Josh Dula. Sorry, I don't know if you can see the hand up, but um, there were a lot of takeaways. That thing was fantastic, that presentation. But <clears throat> for me, there were two main ones. Uh, one was the, <laughs> the point he made about not only is it about access to parks or green space, but it's also about the quality of parks and green space that you, people have access to. I think in Rochester, that has been one of my, as a recent returnee, basically, from, from other places, that's been one of my frustrations here. We have some really great destination parks around here, no question. Uh, but when it comes to the community parks, what people are counting as green space or, or a park, you look at it like, um, oh, I forgot the name of the one over by the post office, but it's, it's nothing. It's like a, it's it doesn't make you want to stop and, and, and visit at all. And we need to do a better job in, in this area of making those community parks more attractive and, and places you want to go spend time. And then the other one is, I think, something that we all knew intuitively, but it's nice to hear it stated um, so, so blatantly, or blatantly, uh, so concisely, uh, that <clears throat> green space we tend to think of as a cost, but it really is, <laughs> not only is it an economic driver in and of itself, like if you have wonderful green spaces, people will make places around those green spaces and, and those places will come up and, and economic activity will occur there. But also it's not simply a matter of economics, it's an, a matter of quality of life, you know, and, and that is an economic factor that is never really taken into account when it comes to, to what to do with green spaces and parks. So that, that was very interesting to me as well. Thank, thank you, Josh, for sharing those. A anyone else? So to, to those points, Josh, I know that um, as I surveyed the series of questions that we had from the presentation last week, there were a lot of questions regarding, you know, the commitment to operating and maintenance expenses. And when I asked one of those questions, you know, he responded kind of to your point that if we say these parks are essential for our mental health, social health, physical well being, um, then if we truly factor in all of the costs, then it just becomes kind of a no brainer that these, these parks have to be uh, created, they have to be invested in, they need to be maintained, and they have to be well thought out in the, uh, as far as experiences go. One question that I had for, for Commissioner Silver offline, um, well, just, just as a background, I, I shared a lot of information about the local scene. Um, usually we have our speakers visit us and they have the benefit of a tour and they can often kind of get at the lay of the land. So I tried to do that virtually and he did a lot of research on his own but I shared information about the, the big parks that we have downtown and some of the situations surrounding parcel five. And so offline, I asked them, is, is it possible to have too many parks? Because sometimes when I talk to people in the city, they say, well, we have so many parks, you know, we don't need another one. Um, and he said, well, there is such a thing as having too many parks if they all offer the same thing. If they're just a patch of grass and 
all you do is just go lay on it to sun or, or walk your dog or whatever, then you don't need every park to do that. You just need one or, or one nearby. Um, so his point was, we need to create these diverse experiences so that each park really needs to have its own character, its, its own kind of draw, that if you wanna do a certain thing, you know where to go. Um, and I thought that was a really interesting point because we sometimes just say um, all too easily, geez, you know, let's just make green space because it's nice for people to have access to nature. But then we see that that space isn't really used because it's just not interesting or attractive. So what, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I totally agree with that. I mean, um, I think not only does every park have to reflect an individual area, but also I think they should reflect the Rochester area when they're in Rochester. Like what are our strengths and, and what are the things we have to offer? And the other thing that I really was struck by, I mean, <laughs> there was a lot, but uh, when, was when he referred to the Department of Fun and it's basically make each park unique and interesting in, in its own right. Um, as it stands now, for instance, mostly, I, you know, I have a dog that I need to take for walks in nature every day, and mostly I have to get in a car and go somewhere to do that. Um, whereas, you know, and I live in Center City, so if there were more places where I could take it where it's relatively peaceful and there's fun stuff for not only her, but for me to do, I'm going to go there instead of climbing in my car and going out to Highland Park, you know, um, so I, I thought the Department of Fun analogy that he made was, was an excellent one. And I think in sort of the development that we see with um, the green spaces we have available to us that are underutilized right now. I mean, we're, we're in a community of tremendous artists. You know, you got Sean Dunwoody, you've got all the, the, <laughs> the um, local arts community that I think is a real strength of Rochester. I would love to see some of that use a little more um, intentionally in, in some of the, the parks or green spaces that we have. Let them do installations, let them um, come up with new ideas for what we can do in the parks and encourage more of that sort of public art. I think, um... One thing that this always reminds me of is uh, I hear people say that we need green space. And so let's put this space over here and this will be the green space. And then you end up with a park that's just grass, you know, because all that is is green space. But when you look into things like, um, uh, you know, uh, the whole kind of concepts behind biophilic design and stuff like that, the whole idea that your body has physical reactions to the smell of trees, to the sound of water, to things like that, that actually increase your health and things like that. Um, you realize that we don't necessarily, we shouldn't necessarily be making this space over here green. Uh, we should be figuring out ways to incorporate nature and greenness into all the spaces we're already in. We should have plants that were, that are, you know, we should green walls, we should have, uh, you know, natural lighting, we should have, uh, you know, just things like water features, you know, uh, we should take into account what the aural soundscape of the city is and uh, design it in such a way that you're not just hearing echoes of cars all the time, you know, and if we do that, if we start to, uh, you know, make that the green space bleed into the rest of the city instead of having to be this separate thing, then when we do have an open space that can be used for recreation, it doesn't just have to be a stand of trees. A stand of trees is great, but again, uh, like uh, the commissioner was mentioning, we can have them do different things, you know? Uh, and I think that the fact that we don't have enough of that sort of calming, relaxing greenness just in our architecture or in our urban design means that we have to use our parks for just that. Whereas if we had more of that in our design, then we maybe we would be able to use our parks in a more diverse way. So let me build on Andre's um, ideas here. And I think um, 
our speaker brought this up, but very briefly, and that is the connections and the connectivity between parks and in our whole, um, let's say our public realm system. And uh, that being the importance of our streets in connecting to the green spaces that are around and how well those spaces, our streets and our sidewalks and our tree lawns and our trees, by the way, he mentioned trees and benches a lot. Um, you know, the quality of that, of the interconnecting aspect of the city, I think is really important. And the more we can, you know, improve upon that, uh, the better off our parks are going to be at the end of the day. Um, so anyway, that's my two cents. Thanks. Yeah, uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Maria. I, I was just going to invite Suzanne Mayer had her hand up and I hadn't seen it. So was it, was it to share, uh, was, was it to share some insights or just jump into the conversation, Suzanne? Oh, well, both. Um, the, I like the yes loitering. I think that there's a lot of scariness involved with that. And so that's why it was determined that we shouldn't have any loiter to begin with. And I think that would help us all and also our, our equity type of discussions and anti-racism here because that's implied with people coming around and loitering. So I think that, um, I think that we should be encouraging stealth stuff on parcel five. <laughs> <laughs> and I have had some certain conversations lately that were very, not conversations, but maybe overhearing. Um, that sounds that exciting. So I think <laughs> I would love to see more participation in that where it is placemaking by, and, and that's what they did in New York. They sort of said, okay, people bring some chairs and make this your own. And uh, I think people are encouraged with seeing basketball downtown. And I think that that was something that struck a lot of people, uh, that people would need it. And in some of the discussions that we've had with um, people, they liked also, and uh, in Lewis Street, they said they loved really the Cobbs Hill Park, where they had a lot of, of um, exercising and that type of thing, and would like to see that replicated, not everywhere, as you say, you don't want to have the same thing everywhere, but in other places, so there's sort of an east side, sort of like north and west and stuff, things like that. So I do, that would also encouraging what we think is loitering, but people having fun and using the parks. Um, it, oh, sorry, <laughs> go ahead. I was just gonna say that, that brought to, to mind an excellent point too, that we, of if you look at the skate park that's been built, that is always hugely popular. So parks don't always need to just be um, green space. They can incorporate exactly what you're talking about, the, the the sort of um, fun activities. There's not much green space in that, <laughs> or I don't think there's any. There is, but there is something wrong with that because I'm an old person. I'm not going to go skateboarding, but I would like to go <laughs> loiter watching people. I think it's fun. I've done it um, in London. I've done it in other places, but there's no place to sit and really enjoy it and say, oh my God, look at that. So um, I think that would be some in addition that where we're using benches, maybe we could do that and they could be, you know, incorporated into some of the, the sculpture and the fences around the area because they still have a fence there. Why? Yeah. So that's yeah. It's to attract <laughs> teenagers because as soon as you make it off limits, then they want to go in there. Well, <laughs> I, actually, I actually have some feedback on the fences. I actually know why the fences are there. Um, interestingly enough, apparently they're having a problem with motorcycles going in there late at night. Oh, I and believe it. The fence acts as a, as a deterrent. Um, people are trying, there's there's a movement to try to better that situation because the, the optics of it are not great. But just, just for some feedback on that. Thanks, Aaron. I, I think it's important. Um, one of the sort of observations that I've had is we're talking about sort of the purposes of all of these different parks that we have. If there's one thing that we do really well as our as a city is we program our spaces for one event really, really well, or mm -hmm. for one season really, really well. Um, we don't really look at the whole of them as an asset over the year, you know, full year of who potential users are, or it's kind of an all or nothing. It's either, you know, that section of uh, MLK Park that gets set up for Holiday Village and it's awesome and it's this 
epic activity center for however long and then it goes away and no one's there again for many, many months and why would you? So, you know, it, I think we, we have the, you know, mentality in the short term. So why we don't start to think about that, I think, or, and how we can we think about that in the long term of looking at all these different places and say, you know, this has, we've done this really well to accommodate this type of activity or to program for this kind of activity. And, you know, maybe not everyone on here, but I assume a lot of you on here, if I said tactical urbanism would know exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, that's essentially what we're doing with events. So why not test out these other ideas for longer term interventions or, you know, programming in parks so we know how they get used before you go in and you put the X thousands and thousands of dollars on some infrastructure and things like that, then why not, you know, see what happens, get the feedback, with you know residents and other users around the area, what works, what doesn't. Yeah, I, I agree, Molly. Um, one of the things that I recall Commissioner Silver saying is not only does each public space and and when we talked about parks, we it, to me it was kind of an umbrella uh, word just to to mean public space. So it, it could be plazas, it could be uh, you know a, again um, all these other types of of public spaces, including the streets. But when, when he said that each park uh, or public space needs to have its own unique character, he also said that each place needed to have at least 10 experiences that they, they, he made a comment, I don't know if it was while he was online or offline, but in order for a city to be considered successful, he felt they needed to be, it was the rule of 10. So 10 destinations and each of those destinations needed to have at least 10 experiences to offer. And, and so that would be really interesting. And if we inter inventoried our public spaces and kind of, it, oh, that's another kind of inventory that we could do, uh, certainly. W one of the things I shared with Commissioner Silver was um, the fact that we in Rochester have a lot of parks that exist over parking garages and that are either uh, significantly above grade or below grade. And we know from research that these types of spaces are not truly, um, welcoming or inviting because people can't look into the park and, and see. If you're driving by, you don't see what's going up on, on Civic Plaza to say, oh, geez, I'm going to just pull the car over and, and go join the, the party or whatever's happening, right? And similarly, it's somewhat the same for MLK Park. So Parcel 5, in my opinion, provides a really great opportunity because it is at grade, because it is uh, flat, and it really does provide what I feel is a great flexible space, which could accommodate a great variety of activities. So hopefully, um, you know, the other, the other comment I want to make is the mayor proved success. We, we always talk about winter in Rochester and how life just, just happens to stop when winter comes. Yet winter comes every year here. And we have to solve this problem because, you know, it, it, it's, it's an ongoing thing. Um, I think the mayor proved very successfully that people will come out for activities if they're, if they're you know, well-planned and, and interesting opportunities with Christmas Village, with the Holiday Village. Um, and, and to your point about seasonality, we, we do have to look more intently on all of the opportunities that we can offer people year-round. This winter, we had a very mild winter. I know that I as, and so many other people were outdoors quite a bit. Um, so uh, I, I think, again, we'll have to add that to the list of suggestions of things to inventory. Um, Anybody else have any comments? Well, if I could just, you know, I, I know um, there's a lot of focus on Parcel 5 um, and there's a lot of opportunity there, you know, it, uh, obviously with it going green, so to speak, um, <laughs> you know, in the near future, um, that's a great asset and an opportunity to think about how to use that. But I do think that, if we continue to focus on that without looking at how it connects and relates to other parks like MLK that is less than five minute walk away, we're just gonna further put the ML MLK park in, you know, in a box. And, and that I don't think is what we wanna do. I mean, again, they could be two very different spaces. One clearly has a huge hardscape component, whether that it stays in its, in, in its entirety or if it's, you know, appropriate or gets reimagined or whatever, but, you know, I really personally do think that both of those, if they are going to be continue to be green spaces or parks, 
it doesn't have to be green, park spaces um, in some aspect, they need to be coordinated and they need to be well connected. Um, because again, you know, you, we just don't want to recreate something and say, well, parcel five has more visibility. So that's where, that's where it's all going to go. And then not think about, you know, MLK. I mean, like MLK is probably, I think probably one of the better lo lo large located parks um, in downtown, but it is so underutilized. And it's just so strange to me that there hasn't been a more public question, conversation, something about that over time. It's just sort of that space when we have that festival, yeah, let's go use the MLK space. Or we have this, yeah, let's go use that, you know, MLK space. So speaking about MLK Park, I mean, I think there are a couple of things. I, I asked Commissioner Silver, Silver about the value of creating a, a dedicated place for people to protest. And I think one of the best things that the city did was to, to um, blacken the walls and allow people to go in and express themselves. And it, it, it's been actually quite an interesting experience to go there and, and read people's messages and meet, be in that space. Um, but the one thing that frustrates me about MLK Park is the fact that so much money was spent on the fountain to, to uh, restore the fountain, which is a dramatic uh, water feature. But then there's a million signs up telling people they can't touch the water. And every historic picture of that park shows people playing in the water. And certainly uh, one of my pet peeves is dealing with liability and liability has such a tremendous impact on how we shape our environment. But is there, I'm, I'm curious to all of you in the community, is there a place that is a spray park or could this fountain be converted to be a spray park where we can limit the liability yet give people uh, that live nearby or, or want to have that experience access to, to the water? Well, I'll tell you this, um, Maria, my opinion about that whole area of, par of the park is that, the, is that it's sunkenness. I think that was a huge mistake. It never should have occurred that way. That should have been up on grade and you could have had all the features that are there now, except it would be accessible and visually accessible. Um, I think that until that is solved, I, I just don't think that's a very good uh, attractive magnet for people to come to. And, and that is the big, Thing in my mind about that whole aspect. I mean, there are some wonderful around the country at grade um, one at grade uh, water features. For instance, one would be in Columbus, Ohio. Um, there's a great uh, water feature in Columbus that is just used dramatically so. And if that, if that darn sunken plaza could be brought up to grade. Um, that would be unbelievable as far as it's, uh, you know, what, what happened there. But, but you know, Roger, I think, go, you know, go ahead, Andre. I was about to say, I think, and I might be mistaken, I have memories of swimming there when I was a child. Um, but I think that at some point someone told me, no, they shut that down long before you were born. And I was like, I don't, I don't know. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I agree that it would be nice for, to let people get in the water there. But I mean, my experience of that park, you know, I do um, parkour, which is like a discipline of climbing on things and uh, relating your body to the urban landscape in interesting ways. And we used to be the almost the exclusive users of that park for a while when it was uh you know back sort of in 2007 to 10 uh no one else was using that park for uh, very much and we would have uh, monthly cleanups where we would go through and clean the place and we would climb all over the place there and it was great um they have since put lots of signs up telling you not to do that. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's again that liability thing. Uh, uh, no climbing, no swimming. <laughs> what can you do? Um, but I, I do have a question about, um, and this is sort of an honest question about uh, the sunkenness. One of the things for me when I travel is that I seem to, I, I find cities with verticality interesting and and pleasant visually and pleasant mm -hmm. to experience
places where, you know, places like Montreal, where you can go up and down, places like Seattle, where you can go up and down. And there, and one of the things that Rochester does not have naturally, uh, except for the, um, except for the gorge, is any of that verticality. We're kind of flat. And so I always liked that uh, MLK was sunken because it provided some of that vertical interest. Um, but then again, you can't see into it. So I guess people who knew more about landscape design than me, what do you guys think about something like that? Can I just, you know, one, one thing I'd like to say about that, I, I love that point that you make, Andre. I think that's, I think it's very true. We, we have a flat city, which, you know, if you're biking, it's great, but uh, um, it, it, that's kind of one nuance that we don't have, especially in our downtown. Um, and the one thing that I want to say is we were talking very much about parks looking into them. What's your experience looking standing in the center of that park and looking out what are you looking at and I think that's something that sometimes gets lost in the conversation mm -hmm. I is I'm a photographer okay so I do weddings portraits but I also do photography for art the, the appeal of a place like uh, Bryant Park or a place like Millennium Park in Chicago is you you get you get in the middle of these parks and you look out in the cityscape sprawls before you so you're seeing green grass or 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 the bean or, or you know an, an interesting sculpture feature but behind it is this um magnificence of of the skyline of the city skyline um i think that for me i've been trying i've always tried to i i know we have to advocate for more parks than just parcel five and we put a lot of emphasis on that but i think part of the reason for that and i've heard other people say this as well is when they're in the center of that space they, it's the one place in the, in the city they feel like they're enveloped, like the city's holding them in. And they can look up and, and have this, this experience of seeing the city from the inside out. There's not a whole lot of places in Rochester where we have the space to do that. And, you know, as much as I, I do like and I do use uh, MLK Park, in fact, we have our engagement photos done there, uh, done in the bowl, some of them. Um, you know, um, you know, I just don't think you necessarily get that same experience of being in it and going and marveling around you is, is what you see. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that every park should, you know, needs to do that, but it certainly is, that's, I, for me, that's a lot of the appeal when I can look outward on something from inside and feel good about it and feel like it's aesthetically pleasing. So Aaron, what is your uh, opinion of the sunken aspect of that park? I think it's interesting. Listen, I, I love the idea of having, you know, uh, you know, like we've been talking about, you know, lots of different experiences um, in, in different parks. And I, I do think that, it, you know, we have to kind of reimagine some pieces of it. Um, I love the utilization of the space as, as being a space for, you know, where people can, um, you know, express themselves about social justice and, and things like that. That's a, that. That was a phenomenal idea and incredibly important for our community. Um, but I think what I would like to see is, is you know, I think, um, I think Molly mentioned it, it's just, you know, better connectivity too between these parks. Um, the one thing I love about New York is you can go from Bryant Park down to Washington Square Park and several parks in between um, via basically, a, um, you know, a bike lane. I've made this trip, I think it's along Broadway. And, uh, and it's this wonderfully kind of relatively safe, connected, protected bike lane that connects all these parks. So you can go through four or five parks uh, that are each unique and each bring something different to the senses um, and, and I love that idea. The, the, the experience isn't just being in these parks, the experience is going from park to park. Um, I'd like to see a little bit of that, more of that in our city. I think that'd be great. What, one of the things um, with MLK Park, if, I mean, if you're looking at the entirety of it, I mean, it's, it's very large and it offers a lot of different things. So like the sunken part we're talking about is really just one side, one aspect. Um, of it. Then you do have the flatter, um, you know, grassy area section, and then you have the um, fountain slash ice rink section as part of that. Um, and to, to be honest, actually, one of my favorite little pieces is that little grove section um, that's just down in the, you know, I think it's the southwestern corner um, yes. there. But the piece, you know, talking about, I agree um, with Andre that there's sort of there's cool aspects, right? If it's not just a flat space, when there's little niches of places to kind of be and things like that. Um, but I think that, you know, my opinion of the sunken space at MLK is not a safe environment. I do not want to be there if I am by myself or if I'm running. It makes me think of the uh, uh, trail spaces or, you know, 
walks where Charles Carroll Plaza uh, was where, you know, I mean, when I go through runs for the city, that is not a place I like to run when I was running by myself. Um, you know, so there's a way to design them. And I think it's just the era from which, I mean, I don't, I don't know specifically, but I was assuming it's just from the era from which, you know, that section of the park uh, was really designed that made it that way. Um, it's very, intrusive in my opinion uh and not welcoming and i also just want to question why it's almost like the forbidden levels like we have this super sunken part <laughs> that you know you may or may not want to go into but then there's this higher part where i don't know about you but i definitely want to know what it looks like from up there but i know that that's not something that's going to go well if i were to attempt it so how that has stayed there in a city that avoids liability like the plague, how that has been there all this time astonishes me. So somehow we can reevaluate the leveling there. I think that could work well. well don't, yeah. yeah, I think- Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, Suzanne. I think a lot of it has also to uh, have an effect. If we now looked at it and open it up to the, the Museum of Play and encouraged, because there is stuff there that could be played with and, and there's more people down there now. So once you have more people, you're gonna have more people coming in. If you sit with um, in like the, the, the near the larger Manhattan Square and you join some of the older people out there talking, they, it's very nice out there on that part of the, that, that area. So as uh, Mitch, as he said the other day, he said you have to have passive parts and active parts in your community. And I think that that has the potential of doing a lot of that stuff without having too much, uh, you know, like you can do group and grading or things, but I quite, that's a little bit like Fort Worth has a sunken thing like that, I think, in fountains. And I think it's, uh, uh, possibility that if you let them and you know talk about the liability I think that's our job to say to the city well what about covering it why don't you just have a you know you're spending it on lawsuits so why don't you spend it here so people can have fun with it I'm sorry I'm really being obnoxious lately but <laughs> I, I, I had it all <laughs> I have stuff for, you know like if we can do it you know but we're having fun oh no that's not something we want you to have any liability for yeah, I, well, that, that's that's certainly something that um, that is a key point that I've been trying to educate people about. You know how much the our built environment is impacted by our culture of liability, and I've seen so many presentations by you know world renowned landscape architects who have created phenomenal spaces, and I always know that it's not American because I'm like, <laughs> you can't you can't do that here, right? Um, so. But go ahead, Kim. Before we move away from um, Strong, I am so disappointed to see the primary entrance, the only entrance into Strong has been directed over onto the, away from, um, it, everything is by the parking garage. You cannot even come out and or enter the Strong Museum from the Manhattan Square Park mm. site. Mm. And, That's you know, unfortunate. Powell Street there, right? And I mean, they've got, I mean, there's all sorts of fun things for the playground things that are there already that these kids would enjoy. But to get there, you literally have to walk probably at least a quarter mile around that building. Doesn't make any sense. Is that going to change yeah. when construction is done of the Adventure Street or Play Street, whatever that is? No, the Adventure Street will funnel around, but, you around know, the back. Make it closer. But right now you can't even get, you know, you can't go out around that side of the building. Yeah, I think with the Adventure Street coming in, they are supposed to make a connection to MLK. It will be part of the neighborhood of play and extend into that area. So there will be a better connection to that park from uh, Strock Museum because they're also switching the entrance to Adventure Place side. So yeah. much better connection to MLK. Okay. Down the line. That's good to hear. Yeah. That connection's done. And also, the um, a play walk is now having an open hop. There's something, at, I, mean, I don't know all the details about it, but that's something at MLK that's the next stage of theirs. And part of what they do is try to connect different parks. So I think that's the next thing we could talk about going up Sio Street or something to that effect. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I kind of want to shift gears just for a few minutes that we have left um, because we've been talking almost exclusively about parks, but we certainly, you know, trails are an important part in our community. Um, one of the things that was identified in the Rocky Riverway, the, the primary thing that was identified by the community was uh, the importance of linking the river trail north and south. Um, and so certainly trails play an important role. And also, uh, the other thing that I'm really fascinated by is this concept of reclaiming some of our asphalt, reclaiming some of our, our roadways for other uses or shared uses. And um, again, with the pandemic, we've seen people uh, take, take back some of that space. And I'm always amazed by the fact that huge cities like New York City and Milan and Paris and Barcelona are reclaiming their asphalt. And yet in Rochester, we don't wanna give up one square inch. So there are a few candidates that are, I think are great test pilots for um, creating some pedestrian or shared spaces. And one of them, of course, would be the Gibbs Street section. Um, and there's a few other ones like Railroad Street. What, what do you guys think about that? Um, I, I don't know if anyone has seen this. I just posted it in the, uh, in the chat a, a couple, a couple slides. Uh, couple messages up. But um, Olmsted worked on a plan for Rochester back in uh, 1911. Yeah, 1911. And uh, at the end of the plan, there's a map, which I linked to, of where he wanted us to put all our parkways. He wanted all the parks that he designed to be connected with all these parkways. Mm -hmm. And as far as I can tell, most of those never got built. And every time I I think about connections between the parks and, you know, the idea of reclaiming space like that, you know, I feel like uh, not just from, it's not just from a, a human standpoint, but also there, uh, I know that there's some work being done in New York City dealing with the wildlife in Central Park and the wildlife in Bryant Park and stuff like that and how, you know, they're creating these weird isolated populations because the wildlife can't get from park to park because they would have to cross through New York City. <laughs> uh, and so the idea is like, how do you actually connect all these parks and connect the wild spaces around them and create that sort of permeability? And I really think it's something worth looking into. And maybe we can take some inspiration from this Olmsted plan. Thank you, Andre. Great comments. Maria, your thought and in bringing up a river walk, if you will, I think is, is in a way one of the crucial aspects of, um, you know, the river development plan. And, and if, I think a lot could happen over there if one of the first things they did was in fact to try to create a seamless walkway around the river. Um, that would actually go in front of some of the buildings that are edging the river and making that happen very similar to what they did in Milwaukee and uh, so many other cities. But in, and instead of calling it a trail, I think it should be called a river walk or something to give it a little bit of uh, you know, personality. And, but I think that, that seamless trail is so critical to the future development of whatever, all the other things they want to try to do along the river downtown, I think is really important. So I'm glad you brought that up. You know, there's a practical aspect to all those too. I mean, we're, we're thinking about these trails as being recreational. I, I don't know about everyone else here, but you know, I bike and ride a number of different forms of micro mobility. These are my highways. These are my expressways. This is how I get around. Um, I can, you know, go from, I, I live in the Highland Park area. Um, you know, I can get to work every day via the Highland Crossing Trail. I can uh, get, in, I, you know, get into the city uh, via the Genesee Riverway Trail. I can get to my mom's via the canal path uh, almost exclusively. Um, you know, uh, it, it, these are, you know, beautiful spaces and they should continue to be. But, you know, we sometimes lose sight of our trail networks as actually being practical ways of inviting people to get out of their cars and, and you know, look at how they can uh, move about our city in a different way. Right to say um, as someone who's so the Genesee Riverway Trail um, I'll be completely honest with you I actually really don't know what expanse of it is or where it goes and where it connects because the times that I've tried to go out and run it um, with the intention of going from downtown to Charlotte or you know whatever um, 
the wayfinding is really, really bad. You just get dumped on a street sometimes. And then yeah. you're supposed to have realized that there's maybe this really old washed out medallion somewhere over on a corner that you missed that now you have to go try to figure out three blocks back. Um, so that's one thing. I mean, and just, I, I do think, I mean, that goes across the board for a lot of our city, but the wayfinding aspect to our parks and our trails, I think could be much more imaginative, but also much more supportive of people who are looking for those spaces. And I mean that not just for those of us on here who already go and go out of our way to try and find and frequent these spaces, but then the other people who are coming in and visiting our city or you know, maybe you work in the city and you go to the same parking garage every day and you could not tell me that you even knew there was a trail around the corner from your office building or something like that. So you know, I think that's a huge component of this. We can talk about physical connectivity, but obviously that takes a lot of time and investment and capital and a very short-term option for that could just be raising awareness, which is then just gonna raise the amount of voices and support we have to make them better moving forward. Yes, I, I agree. That's a great, that's a great point. Um, we're, we're coming up on, uh, on the hours, so I'm, I'm going to just let anybody who has any final thoughts or comments uh, jump, jump in. Go ahead, Suzanne. Well, I thought it was fun because, well, first of all, my daughter worked for Parks and we're in New York, and she would tell us stories that would really be, you know, like, Oh, today I went to a park. We're doing an inventory of parks, and um, I found a dead body. <laughs> I was like, okay, so you got to remember that you they're talking that there are a lot of this other stuff that went on to get where they are, and now uh, that's where we are in Rochester. We don't have the Bryant Park needles, and and a lot of we've done some of that cleanup. So I so think, I think <laughs> really, <laughs> and but, but, but it also. It goes back to the point that, that uh, Commissioner Silver said is, you know, the good uses push out the bad uses. So if, if we create an interesting and inviting place that becomes used, then hopefully it will not allow for those other things to, to happen as, as frequently or as easily. Yeah, that, that, I was going to echo that. It's basically, I, I used to work on Hudson oof, at Optical Gauging Products probably in the 90s. And I remember Pulaski Park right behind their campus over there could be, and if it were dedicated to the good uses, it could be a wonderful park, but people would get murdered there. <laughs> I remember like one night I left work and got home and watched the news and sure enough, someone had been murdered there uh, as I was driving home. So... I, I don't know where I was going. <laughs> this is kind of a long tangent, but I think it's, you, you put your finger right on it. You've got to get the good uses for each park to push out the bad uses like that. And then you won't hear about murders in parks anymore and, and bodies being found in parks. Or if you do, it will be very rare. I was, <clears throat> I was just trying to say that we, we really have a lot of uh, fun things. I mean, they've done, a, I had great tours of different parks of different, you know, they are like sort of like an imagineer, like, look, this isn't this, this very interesting. You could do this in Rochester. Oh yeah, we could. So um, I'm not trying to be negative there. I just think that one of the things that is very difficult, one of the things that we saw, we tried to activate the, the park on SIO and, uh, and we had the yoga on that was where Sean had a lot of his, his, his murals. We tried to do the same thing at Lewis Street and take the same group to Lewis Street. And I met with them and I said, this place is a, a park that could do activation on, on Sunday. And I couldn't convince them to come because they believe that it wasn't safe. Well, it isn't safe, it is safe. And I walk there all the time. I think it's really, we have to work really, really hard on, um, uh, you know, I, I'm changing people's minds about what parks are too by doing some of what you're talking about with the programming, but it's take, it takes convincing of people who are gonna be, that you're trying to bring in to help you that it's more than that. And it's, uh, uh, and trying to look at the, what do you have in your park? I like the inventory thing. I think that's something that we do first is what do we have? 
and what's good about them, what and uh, the, the improvements, and then make some sort of a planned effort on how do you do it all together and, and a combined and connected type of thing. I agree with that totally. But I think that already we're starting to go that park or that park. And I think it's really about, you know, and then I think we should not necessarily go downtown to look at them first, but in our neighborhoods. And yes. that's where our neighborhoods actually, um, we've ignored them for so long that, I mean, we've ignored all the parks, let's face it, but <laughs> that it would be, you know, we have to do some in some places too, because everybody's gonna get a, oh, you're always pouring money downtown. Well, what about us? If you put a basketball court downtown, maybe they wouldn't be saying that, but <laughs> that I just like the skateboard. So I think that um, that's enough of me. <laughs> well, I wanna kind of go back to your point about parcel five and, and stealth activation. Um, and, and the other point that we ran a quick survey about whether people would be interested in participating in facilitated walks by the Community Design Center. We certainly identified a, a variety of opportunities and experiences around, you know, seeing the various murals and public art, historic tours, uh, scenic tours, nature tours. I led a group of ladies uh, from the Rochester Public Library to, from Rendell to Susan B. Anthony Square. Uh, their, their group was called uh, Nature Nuts and they used to go out to walk at Powder Mill Park or, or the other green spaces. Um, so I read, I, I ran this urban tour and they were just fascinated by the experience. But again, they would never have done it if they hadn't been given this safe and protected space. So I, I one thing I invite all of you to, to do what you can to invite people to have these experiences that hopefully will lead them to feel more comfortable and to realize that they can be uh, exploring uh, a little bit further, feeling you know safe. Uh, and the other thing is do whatever you can to uh, to create your stealth activity or invite people to use uh, parcel five while it's been greened and as we explore the many possibilities that, that we hold in our community. Uh, with that, I just wanna give our panelists, uh, I wanna say a, a special thank you to all of you for taking the time, but especially our panelists who took time out of their busy days to share with us. And any of you three have uh, any closing comments? Uh, take it away. I'll start uh, just real quick. Uh, one more shout out to Commissioner Silver. That was a, uh, I think uh, I think we were all inspired by that. I think we need that uh, a little bit coming out of, the, especially coming out of the last year. Um, it's been hard to get excited about our cities and what we can do uh, to create better spaces, better public spaces. And uh, just hearing that uh, inspired me and really fired me up to to, to keep doing what we're doing. So um, I'm I'm excited about the future. And uh, and yeah, that's 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 the good stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would echo that. I definitely felt very inspired. I think, um, you know, had I had access to the data immediately after that, I would have immediately gone in and done that assessment of how, what dollars went to what parks when. Um, and I, the big focus, picking up on what Suzanne said, the neighborhood parks, I'm, mo I'm most interested to seeing what happens with those because I think a lot of those, they're smaller, they tend to be a little more neglected and they're going to take, as you said, a lot more than just you know, putting out the bench and hand-holding and say, well, come on, let's make this park, you know, put more eyes in this park without real programming activity that and dollars that says to the community, we are going to invest in this park. So, you know, so you feel safe here. So you have something to do that actually does reactivate that park. Uh, you know, there's a lot of goodwill building that needs to be done. I think in a lot of our communities with a lot of our parks and some of it is going to have to be going in and just saying, clearly we didn't, this wasn't right to start. What do we do now? Um, how do you know, how do we make this work for you as the residents around it um, as all as part of that inventorying. Uh, but I guess my last pitch and it would be the thing that this is the next step from this, so to speak, a lot of parallels with what we've been talking about. We talk about park spaces and activity spaces and destinations. Um, but very similarly, just around the corner from downtown, what we're talking about, we have the um, Salem Stadium, the uh, Red Wing Stadium, and Brown Square Park. And I think we, they are right there in a shot, and you would never know 
if you were in any one of them, that the other one existed. And there's so many other cities that do so well building their stadium or entertainment districts or all these other things. We could do so much better to in integrate those spaces and have that be an activity space as well. So I see that as step two. Parks, and then let's do some fun. I agree. Andre? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, uh, the two things that I'm really taking away are the the diversity and the integration, you know, just like I said at the beginning, everyone financially should have a diversified portfolio and not put all your money in one thing. And as a city, we should be diversifying our portfolio of experiences, you know, and we can't just say parcel five is going to solve it or something like that. We need to uh, be investing in all those little parks and we need to then be building those connections because uh, we want there to be opportunities for natural discovery of each of these experiences and you don't have to just happen to know that it's there so you have to uh find ways to connect physically and uh also you know just connect uh with things like programming and stuff like that connect to the communities uh with these uh these spaces so i think that if we can get those two things down where we're focusing on lots of little things and then connecting all those little things, then we can get a nice net that reaches all through the city instead of just hoping that one big thing is gonna fix everything. Well, thank, thank you all. It's been a great conversation. We hope to have more of these types of conversations and hopefully invite each of you to individually reach out through your networks and continue these conversations. You all know the next few slides uh, are upcoming. Our next lecture is, um, I believe, May 26th. Um, with Dr. Destiny Thomas, and she's speaking about uh, um, adult, um, restorative justice, so um, atonement and healing. And uh, so that's a month out, and we'll have other, other things to look forward to after that. So thanks so much, everyone. Really appreciate your participation. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. We will have a recording of this to share with all of you. And if you haven't filled out our survey, please do so so that we can get some feedback. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone.